Hello brothers and sisters in Christ and welcome back to another word study uh, on the word repent slash repentance. We did the Old Testament, now I'm getting back around to doing the New Testament. I'm trying to do this outside, there's tons of noise, there's tons of wind, and um, probably going to do an update video on the ministry when it comes to the equipment that I have. But um, we're in the book of Matthew. So if you turn to Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, we're going to go th all the way through. This is a word study. We're trying to prove that repent slash repentance is not a physical act. It's not works. Because one of the lies you'll hear out there is that repentance is not part of salvation because repentance, the plan of salvation, because repentance is works. And the Bible says, for by grace are ye saved through faith and not of works. Or through faith and not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, not of works. So repentance isn't part of it. Well, we're proven through the Old Testament so far not one time is repent. And repentance is used like once or twice, but most, all, most Old Testaments, the word repent, not once was it a physical act. It's something that happens in the heart first. And the evidence that it happened in the heart, that's when the, you have the physical act after you've already repented. Okay, that's why you have fruits meet for repentance. Evidence of repentance is a change in your life and your attitude and how you look at something. How you treat something, that is. How you look at something still the heart. Okay, Matthew chapter 3 verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay. Now, kingdom of heaven is talking about the millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. So, real quick, if you go to turn to first or Matthew eleven twelve, and from the day of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Talking about Jerusalem, so we know it's a physical kingdom. All right? I just want to throw that out there real quick. Also, the repenting here, it has to do with them repenting of them turning away from God. The repenting is their heart, having their heart turn back to God. And here's one of the biggest reasons I think why. 1 Samuel 8, 5, and we're going to read why further down. But 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 5. And said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy son, sons walk not in thy ways, now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel. The people are coming to Samuel. His kids are doing wrong. Right there it says not, they don't walk in the way of God. But this thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so, they, so do they also unto thee. Part of the repentance, I think, here is them turning back to God. They rejected their king, and as we read further down, he's preparing the way for Jesus Christ. Their king. They rejected him once. They rejected him a second time. They won't be rejecting him the third time when he comes back for the millennial kingdom, the 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ. So repent there is something that happens in the heart. Okay, It's not a physical act. It's something that happens in the heart. So let's keep reading. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Jesus came as their king, but they rejected him. Okay. Verse 4. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. 
and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Verbal. Okay, there's confessing. Okay. They repent happens in the heart. Okay, I'm a sinner, I've done all these bad things. Then they confess it with the mouth. What does the Bible say? Out of the, abund out of the abundance of the mouth, the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay. It happens in the heart first, now they're confessing it. Verse 7, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. It bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. Okay? Fruits are evidence of repentance. John had the Holy Spirit in him. The Holy Spirit was saying their hearts, was showing John their hearts. They weren't repenting. They did not have sorrow for sinning against God. They were coming down here because everybody else was, and it's considered, I guess it's, it feels like it's a religious thing, and since everybody else is doing it, we want to be part of it. We want to be shown doing something religious and everything. So he knew their hearts. So when he says fruit meet for repentance, repentance wasn't happening in their heart. Why? Because the evidence of repentance is fruits. There was no fruit. Okay. So repentance there is not works. Okay. True repentance is having sorrow for sinning against God. When it applies to salvation, when it applies to almost anything to a point. Okay, repentance is having sorrow for sinning against God, an almighty God, okay, a righteous God, a perfect God. See, Acts 26.20, we're not going to uh, turn there, but Acts 26.20, but, but show them, but show first unto them at Damascus and Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. So first you repent and turn to God. It's a heart. They rejected, I'm going back to the Old Testament, they rejected God as their king. When you ask somebody who was the first king of the Jewish people, most people would say, well, God, Saul. Uh, no, Saul wasn't the first king. God was their first king, and they rejected God ruling over them, as we just read. Okay? And, they would, and if you've known the story of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they rejected Jesus Christ. They rejected God again as their king. Okay? But there's supposed to be works after you repent, proving that you repented. If I tell you uh, my desire... And my heart is to wash my truck. It's getting really dirty. I keep putting it off. And my desire is I need to, you know, in my heart, I want to wash my truck. If I never washed my truck, did I really have a desire? No evidence that I had a desire to fix my truck up or wash or something as I get out there and I fix my truck up and wash it. The actions prove that it happened in the heart. Okay. Repentance is a heart thing. Repent is a heart thing. Okay. So they repented in their heart and then down here they're confessing their sins. Okay. And yeah, we can go off on a whole, whole tangents on the fact that they are against confessing uh, with the mouth, part of salvation, confessing um, your repentance and your belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Here's people confessing. Confessing is part, because this is Old Testament, Matthew 3, 9. Matthew 3, verse 9. I guess we're going to keep going then. And think not to say within yourselves we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees, therefore Every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down. Remember, fruits meet for repentance. And cast into the fire. I mean, one can look at that as instructional righteousness in the sense that evidence of salvation, when looking at someone, first you look at yourself, 
then you look at the body of Christ, professing Christians, okay? If they're not bringing forth good fruits, like fruits meet for repentance, then they never repented, right? And if they don't repent, and uh, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and call upon the name of the Lord to save you, ask God to save you, uh, they're going to be cast into the fire. Verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Okay. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, whose fan is in the, his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So we see up here the word repentance. I baptize you with water unto repentance. Okay? Baptism, he's baptizing people first. There's a physical act right there. But is the baptism repentance? No. Because it says unto repentance. It's happening before. And as we read over here, the repentance is they're confessing their sins afterwards. It's the heart changes. Your heart changes and says, okay, I've done this wrong, I've done this wrong, Lord, I've turned from you. I, I want to focus back on you. I want to turn to you. You're the God of Israel. I, I've been following all their gods or not obeying the law, all this stuff, because it's still Old Testament. Okay. And I had to keep reading because when they say, because the baptism of the Holy Ghost and with fire, because up there it says cast into the fire, and then down here it talks about the baptism of, um, with the Holy Ghost, getting saved, and with fire, those who are lost. Okay. Now, I looked at the word chaffed. Or am I jumping down too far? No. Uh, will be burned up, burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, chaff, I looked up because I was curious. Get this. The husk, or dry calyx of corn, and grasses. In common language, the word is applied to the husk when separated from the corn by thrashing, thrashing, riddling, or winnowing. The word is sometimes used rather improperly to denounce straw cut small for the food of cattle. It's not. It's what's around the corn. It's the husk. It's junk. Okay. So the chaff with unquenchable fire. It's just junk. If you're not serving God and you're not truly repenting and you're not baptized here with the Holy Ghost, then he looks at you like chaffed. Okay. He will burn and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Lost people. Jesus, now if he was their king, it's still saying the same thing. People who reject Jesus as their king, but the whole nation rejected Jesus Christ. And that's when his death, burial, and res resurrection came in. And now it's open to everybody. Salvation. Okay. Another verse real quick about Jesus as their king. John 12, 12. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna! Blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, the King cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. Okay. Just another thing I want to throw in there about what we were just talking about here. They rejected their King. Jesus is coming back. John the Baptist is preparing the way for Jesus Christ. So they are turning from God, and they wanted man as their king. Uh, they're repenting, and they need to turn back to God. And in turning back to God, you're going to start obeying God and doing things His way, the Bible way. I'm talking about today now for instruction of righteousness. When you turn back to God, it's not just on looking at God. Your actions will prove the repentance in your heart that you're looking back to God by your actions and how you live your life. So, Matthew 4, 17. Matthew 4, verse 17. And we are going to read to third... Oh, just verse 17 then. 
From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, Jesus took up where uh, John left off, everything we just talked about. Okay, John 3.30, He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. John the Baptist saying, He's taken over, I've got to become less, so he become more. But he's preaching the same thing that John the Baptist was preaching. Okay, Repent happens in the heart. The whole thing about Jesus being their king, how they've sinned against God by turning away from him. And they're not obeying his laws. Because like I said, this is still Old Testament. Go up to Matthew 9.13. Too far. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Let's go back. I don't know why I didn't start at 12. Let's start at 12. But when Jesus heard that he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Verse 11 talks about the Pharisees getting involved again, and he can see that there's self-righteousness. He didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Okay? Something that happens in the heart, you go, okay, I sinned. And instead of saying, I'm okay with my sin, this is what I want, you turn to God in the heart and say, I don't want this sin anymore. I don't want to do things against God. It's not about sinless perfection, and it's not about works. It's never about works. Okay. Yeah. Going to the next one. Matthew eleven twenty. Turn to Matthew eleven twenty. Actually, let's start in 18. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath the devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine giver, a friend of publicans and sinners. Notice he didn't claim to be a friend of publicans and sinners. It says they. Okay. They say. But wisdom is justified of her children. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Okay? They repented not. Their hearts weren't formed. Let's see, was I going to keep going? Upbraid. I was wondering about that. I looked it up. Upbraid to remove with severity. Okay? So, right there, repentance, repented not. In their hearts, they didn't repent, they didn't turn to God. They love the miracles. They always love the miracles. But they didn't repent. Let's keep going. Matthew eleven twenty one. 21. Woe unto thee, Cherizen. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. See, sackcloth and ashes is what they put on showing fruits of their repentance because they're sorrowful. But putting it on isn't the repentance. Repentance has to happen in the heart that makes you want to put on the sackcloth and put ash on your head. Okay. Um, gosh, I wanted to do this, but I didn't have it set up. <laughs> so, I had a website talking about Tear and Sidon, and I wanted to look it up. But um, it's basically um, a wicked city. And the fact that if these works could turn them and get them to believe, how bad is it that you guys won't believe? Just making them look bad because they are for not believing. Okay. 
Matthew 12, 41, next time. Matthew 12, 41. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold a greater than Jonas is here. Now if you, if you want to turn, like I said, always pause the video as we go along. I'll turn to some uh, verses. Sometimes I'll turn to all of them. Sometimes if I realize it's going to be a long video, I try to just follow along and hold the Bible here so I can keep from it being like a two hour video. But Jonah 3.3, 3, chapter 3, verse 3. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. Okay. Notice what we just read there. It says, The men of Nineveh shall rise in Matthew 12.41, and judgment with this generation shall condemn it, because they, all of Nineveh, repented at the preaching of Jonas. Now, the reason I quoted that verse is, did you know it's 144 miles roughly at 3 miles walking speed per hour? Uh, the city, if you could walk through it in 3 days, as it says, it's 145 miles. And that's just from one side to the other. It doesn't show the whole, um, what is it, uh, square feet. So 144 miles. That's a lot of people and that's a really, really big city. Okay, Jonah 3, 4, the next one. And Jonah began to enter into the city of a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. This is what Jesus is talking about. Okay? Because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, the greater than Jonas is here. Okay? This is just some man. Uh, Nineveh was a uh, Gentile city, and it was a heathen city, and they were doing all kinds of wickedness in the sight of the Lord. And, and they, uh, they were also, from my understanding, when I read and did the study on it, they were the enemies of the Jewish people. That's one of the reasons why Jonah was like, I, uh, you want me to go there? They'll kill me. And why he fled. So, repentance, okay? Turning from your wicked way, turning to God. Not fixing your life and becoming sinlessly perfect. And then turning to God. You turn to God first. And Jesus is doing all these miracles and these people aren't believing in him. They refuse to repent. Remember we talked about the Old Testament, they rejected God as their king. New Testament, they're rejecting, I mean, when Jesus came, the New Testament hasn't started yet. When Jesus came again, God manifest in the flesh to be their king. They were rejecting Jesus as their king. They were also living in wickedness and wouldn't turn from that wickedness in their hearts. So, Matthew 21, verse 28. From 28 to 31. Okay. But well, what think you? Think ye. A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterwards he repented. How do we know that happened in the heart? Keep reading. And went. Two different things. Repentance in the heart and the action to prove that he repented, and he went. Talk about two separate things. And he came to the second and said likewise, and he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Okay. Bottom line, fruits meet for repentance. Okay, There's evidence of your heart by your actions. Okay, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Uh, fruits meet for repentance. Okay. You can say one thing and then do another. 
like this guy did here. Okay. I, I go, sir, and then went not. We have a lot of people professing to be Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, and they, they, there's no fruits there proving that they're Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women by their actions. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Okay. All should come to repentance. We just read up there, the people wouldn't repent. And Jesus was long-suffering. Don't you think Jesus was long-suffering? Uh, everything He went through, and then the Jewish people as a nation just flat out rejected Him? Actually, I skipped something. I didn't finish verse 31. Give me a second. Verse 31. I am not perfect. We have to keep reading. Whether of them twain did he the will of his father, they said unto him, The first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. And that's why I read the one about uh, that all should come to repentance. Okay? Jesus is long-suffering, but once again, repentance is something that happens in the heart. It's not based off works. Okay? Turn to Matthew 21, we're already there, 32. Let's just keep reading. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye have seen it, repented not afterward, that ye might believe him. Okay? Always talked about that, how repentance, if you skip repentance when it comes to the plan of salvation, your belief is just in your head. But if you read this, it almost has a correlation where if you refuse to repent, you're not believing. This is back in the Old Testament, though, because you read it again. The publicans and harlots believed him. Why? Because we read about John the Baptist. They were, they were being baptized, came up, and then they had repentance in their heart, and they were confessing their sins. They believed John the Baptist. Okay? These people refused to repent. Okay? Where were we at? Repented not afterwards that ye might believe him. Here's another parable. But we're not going that far. But right there, the whole point of these studies is just to get the context of repentance. Sometimes we can learn something when you do word studies. But I just really want to press that you have to have repentance as part of the plan of salvation. You will not believe in your heart if you skip repentance. These people believed in their heart. Okay, and the ones that refuse to repent, refuse to believe. And a lot of people who take repentance out of salvation, they don't believe in God's Word completely. Well, they they'll pick and choose stuff, but they don't believe 100%. And what they do believe is just in the head. It's knowledge, intellectual knowledge. It's not of the heart. Uh, harlot. Let's look at Luke 7.36. Because Mary said, uh, real quick, the harlots go in. Um, but the publicans and the harlots believed him. Let's look about a harlot. Luke 7, 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. Okay? She's in a repetitive state. She's sorry. That's why she's crying. She knows how sinful and wicked she is. And she's at her feet. Oh, but it doesn't say repentance. No, what she's doing is showing fruits meet for repentance. It's evidence of repentance. You don't have to say repent. Jesus didn't have to tell her, you need to repent. She's already doing it. Okay. Let's go to another verse, because uh, we saw about harlots and publicans. Publicans, Luke 18.10. 
Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. It's talking about self-righteousness. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful to me, a sinner. He's in a repentant state. Okay, what's the evidence of that? He's beaten his chest. Okay, he won't even look up to heaven. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. You know, like people who get repentance out of salvation, try to take it out. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. It's a humbling thing to fall on your knees and admit that you are a sinner, you sinned against God, but it's not just admitting it, but having sorrow in your heart. That's the humble part. Anybody can say, I'm a sinner. The humbling part comes in when you have sorrow for sinning against God. Okay. So the verse right there, the repentance, is something that happens in the heart. And he talked about uh, harlots and publicans, because okay, they didn't believe. When you skip repentance, you don't have real belief. Real belief, real belief is in the heart. Up here, they always say belief in the head, and I have too, but maybe we should be saying intellectual they say intellectual belief, they had head knowledge. If you skip repentance, all you have is head knowledge. You don't have true belief in the heart. So, Matthew 27, 1. Okay, we're going to go all the way to 5, just making sure. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. He's admitting that he's a sinner. And they said, What is that to us? See thou, thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Now what is this repentance a good uh, show of? Um, oh, here it is. Okay, good. Oh, we've got to check my notes. Okay. It's a good example of worldly sorrow. Okay. He's sorry the consequences. Here's why. Matthew 26, 24. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, he was present, then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou sayest it. Judas didn't have repentance of the heart, he had repentance in the head. He was repenting of the consequences of his actions. Okay? He wasn't sorry for actually betraying Jesus. He was sorry of the consequences. When he saw, notice what it says there in Matthew 21, verse 3. When he saw that he was condemned. When he saw he was condemned, then he was sorry. But he was sorry about the consequences. He wasn't sorry for actually betraying Jesus. If he had got away with his 30 bags of silver, no consequences or anything, he'd have done it again in a heartbeat. Okay. John 13, 21. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him, and he should ask who it is, who it should be, of whom he spake. He then, lying on Jesus' breast, said unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, and after the sop, 
Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That, that thou doest, go quickly. Right. Judas was there when he said, he spelled it out. Whoever, just, whoever um, betrays me, this is what's going to happen. So woe to that man. So, the book of Matthew, we are done. Remember, remember, don't let anybody deceive you in trying to get you to change your mind or fall back and say, okay, maybe repentance isn't part of the plan of salvation. The Bible says, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Repentance happens before salvation. And as you've watched my recent video on uh, repentance, uh, salvation for lost sinners, repentance, there's actually two types of repentance. Worldly sorrow, let's do godly sorrow, we just read that for godly sorrow work of repentance to salvation. Godly sorrow, and then there's worldly sorrow. Okay? Two types of repentance. One, uh, you're sorry for your sins, and you're actually sorry to God for my sins. doesn't matter the consequences. Yeah, I'm going to hell. I don't want to go to hell. Lord, save me. But I understand I deserve to go to hell for what I've done. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's godly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is, you mean I have to go to hell? I don't want to go to hell. But in your heart, because God looks at the heart, you're like, well, if there wasn't a hell, I'd have no problem with sin. I'm not really sorry for sinning against God. I'm sorry that my sins are going to send me to hell. And that's why you see a lot of these false religions taking hell out of the equation. So you don't have to repent. You know what I'm saying? For these people that have worldly sorrow. They don't have to repent and be sorry about the consequences anymore because they've done it. They've, you know, think they can do away with hell when the Bible says hell is real and it's eternal. You'll burn in hell for all eternity. So, Book of Matthew, done. And we'll continue to go on and stand for our true biblical repentance as it applies to salvation. So I will see you in the next book that we will be going over.